Hello everyone. Bacterial meningitis is a medical emergency, just like stroke or myocardial infarction. And still, many patients are initially misdiagnosed and they don't receive appropriate treatment in time. By the end of this video, you will understand why this happens and how easy it actually is to do something about it. Fever, headache, neck stiffness, altered level of consciousness. This is the textbook clinical presentation of bacterial meningitis. But in reality, less than 50% of patients present with all four of these symptoms. Most patients will have a fever, but elderly people and people who are immunocompromised don't necessarily have a fever even with bacterial meningitis. This is because their immune system is simply too weak to mount an effective inflammatory response to this overwhelming infection. Headache also. Most patients with bacterial meningitis will have a headache. That is, the ones who are conscious enough to tell you that their head hurts like hell. Most patients will have an altered level of consciousness. At least they will be drowsy or obtunded, but some may be comatose. The least reliable sign out of these four is neck stiffness. Only about 50% of patients will have neck stiffness. When it is present, it can be very impressive. Your patient's spine may feel like a wooden board, literally, so completely rigid, impossible to bend forward. But many patients will not have a stiff neck, so the absence of this sign does not exclude a central nervous system infection in any way. And once again, it's the elderly who pose a diagnostic challenge here, because in elderly patients, it can be very hard to determine whether their neck stiffness is the result of something acute like bacterial meningitis or something chronic like degenerative changes to their cervical spine. As a general rule, if this is chronic, you'll find that mobility is equally reduced in all directions, while in bacterial meningitis or some other acute cause of meningeal irritation, you'll find that the forward flexion is most severely reduced. On top of that, most patients with bacterial meningitis will obviously be very sick. They will look septic. So again, just like every time, you will pay close attention to their vital signs. And this overall appearance is what sets them apart from patients with aseptic or viral meningitis, who will usually look more or less okay. They will have a headache, they might have a stiff neck, but otherwise they will be alert, awake, and definitely not septic. I explain this in detail in my video on the differences between encephalitis and meningitis. So okay, once you suspect that your patient might have bacterial meningitis, of course you will do a thorough neurologic exam. You will look for focal abnormalities, so a focal neurologic deficit, and you will ask about recent seizures. So if your patient had a focal neurologic deficit or a seizure, you will suspect that there is some focal abnormality in their brain, which means you will already look for complications of bacterial meningitis. In simple terms, you are looking for vascular accidents, like a stroke or a venous sinus thrombosis, and collections of pus, meaning intracranial abscess or empyema. This means that you will order a head CT scan, so imaging to detect these focal abnormalities. But let's discuss altered level of consciousness a little bit more. This is such a crucial finding, and yet its importance is so often underestimated in practice. This is because in emergency departments we get to see a lot of elderly patients, patients with pre-existing dementia and functional disability. And these patients often present with an altered level of consciousness among other things. And then it can be very difficult for a clinician to tell to what degree is their altered level of consciousness the consequence of something acute like an infection and something chronic like their pre-existing dementia. Unfortunately, there are no guidelines that would help us with this everyday dilemma. On top of that, we know that simple everyday problems like a UTI can trigger encephalopathy and delirium in patients with pre-existing dementia and functional disability. However, if you have a patient with no history of dementia, with no history of functional disability, I don't care how old they are, if they present with an altered level of consciousness and signs of some sort of infection, you have to suspect a central nervous system infection. This is your primary concern. 
number one. Everything else is secondary. Because if you miss a patient with a central nervous system infection, the consequences will always be disastrous. So don't assume it's just a UTI just because your patient is older than you or because they have gray hair. I mean, Keanu Reeves is almost 60, right? If this guy presented with an altered level of consciousness and a fever, would you assume, oh, it's probably a UTI? I hope not. Don't play the Russian roulette with your patient's life and your career. You may get away with it a few times, but it's only the matter of time before you make a terrible, terrible mistake, which will result in someone's death or permanent disability. Don't do this. If you see a patient with a fever and an altered level of consciousness, your primary concern is a central nervous system infection. And okay, once you suspect that your patient might have bacterial meningitis, there are some clues in their clinical presentation and the physical examination that will point toward the most probable pathogen. The most common pathogen, the most common cause of bacterial meningitis in adults is Streptococcus pneumoniae, pneumococcus, the same bug that is the most common cause of bacterial pneumonia, bacterial sinusitis, and otitis media. So, if your patient recently had symptoms of one of these infections right before they developed symptoms of meningitis, this is significant. This means that Streptococcus pneumoniae is a pretty safe bet. The second most common cause of bacterial meningitis in adults is Neisseria meningitis or meningococcus. Your typical patient with meningococcal meningitis will be a teenager or a young adult. It can infect older age groups as well, of course, but this is much less common. The telltale sign of meningococcal meningitis is the characteristic petechial non-blanching rash. However, this rash tends to be less impressive in pure meningitis than in meningococcemia. So make sure that you have a good light source and check the entire surface of the skin very carefully. Haemophilus influenzae used to be another very important pathogen for bacterial meningitis, especially in children, but since we introduced routine vaccination against Haemophilus, it's virtually become non-existent. I can't remember the last time I saw a patient with Haemophilus influenzae meningitis. The third most important pathogen today is Listeria monocytogenes, a foodborne pathogen that can cause bacterial meningitis again in all age groups, but it most commonly affects people over 50 and people with some sort of risk factor like people with diabetes mellitus, immunocompromised individuals, pregnant women. So if you see a patient with one of these risk factors and signs of bacterial meningitis, you will consider Listeria. I will talk more about this when you come to the treatment. There are also other bacteria that can potentially cause bacterial meningitis like group A streptococcus that is becoming increasingly common with the recent surge in invasive streptococcal infections. But there is one pathogen that I feel doesn't get enough attention in textbooks and that is Staphylococcus aureus. I recently posted a video where I talk about this bug and how it can cause pretty much any kind of infection including bacterial meningitis. If you see a patient with staphylococcal meningitis, you have to ask yourself the question, where did this bug come from? Your main concern is the heart. So you're looking for signs of endocarditis, which means you will order an echocardiogram because from the heart, staphylococcus aureus can end up anywhere, including the brain. Okay, now that you have a good reason to believe that your patient might have bacterial meningitis and you have a pretty good idea what is the most probable cause of this meningitis, it's time to diagnose it. And the only way to do that is to perform lumbar puncture or spinal tap. And here we come to the second biggest problem with bacterial meningitis. The problem with spinal tap is that many doctors are kind of afraid of it because they are not very experienced with it and it does look scary. On top of that, many remember from medical school that if you do a spinal tap, if you evacuate some of the CSF and your patient's intracranial pressure is increased, as it often is in bacterial meningitis, this could lead to herniation, which means your patient will die and it will all be your fault. Now, this risk of herniation is greatly exaggerated, to say the least, but this is a topic for another video. Suffice to say that nowadays, the vast majority of patients with bacterial meningitis 
get a head CT scan before spinal tap. Now this in itself wouldn't be a problem if it didn't cause delay in the treatment of bacterial meningitis. And every hour that we spend second guessing and ordering an unnecessary tests, the bacteria in our patient's brain are having the time of their lives turning our patient's brain into pus, literally. Every hour of delay reduces our patient's chances of survival and of a good neurological recovery. So how can we get around that? If you do think that your patient needs a CT scan before spinal tap, okay, so be it, I won't argue with that. Just make sure that you start treatment beforehand. Take two sets of blood cultures and start antibiotics in accordance with the guidelines. That's it. After that, you can do a whole body scan if you are so inclined. In over 50% of patients, you will be able to isolate the pathogen from the blood cultures. That is why we take two sets before we administer antibiotics. On top of that, if you are afraid that these antibiotics will mess up the typical CSF profile in bacterial meningitis, don't be. This will not happen. Even if they happen to kill the bacteria right away, you can still detect them with PCR, which is becoming ever more widely available. On top of that, the typical findings in CSF that are characteristic for bacterial meningitis will not change this rapidly. So, you will find a high leukocyte count consisting mostly of neutrophils. Your normal white blood cell count in healthy, normal CSF is 0 to 5, and none of these cells should be neutrophils. In bacterial meningitis, you will see thousands if not tens of thousands of cells, most of which will be neutrophils. Sometimes you can see right away that the CSF is not normal. Normal CSF should look like water, completely clear without color. CSF filled with neutrophils will be turbid, yellowish, sometimes literally pure pus. With some pathogens, the findings are less impressive. With listeria, instead of finding tens of thousands of cells, you might see a couple of thousand, and not all of these cells will be neutrophils. There will be many lymphocytes as well. In immunocompromised and elderly patients, the absolute cell count may be abnormally low. It's the same reason why they sometimes don't have a fever. Their immune system is unable to mount an effective response to this overwhelming infection. In addition to the cell count, in the CSF you'll also take a look at glucose, lactate and protein concentration. Glucose in bacterial meningitis will almost always be very low, sometimes even zero, especially in pneumococcal meningitis. Protein concentration will be elevated and lactate should be elevated as well. Many times there will be bacteria visible in the CSF and sometimes from the gram stain you will be able to suspect the most probable pathogen, but be very careful with this. Do not de-escalate empiric therapy based on these initial gram stain findings. Wait until you know exactly what kind of bacterium it is and what it's susceptible to. If you don't find bacteria in the CSF, this does not exclude bacterial meningitis. Now, besides CSF analysis, there are some other tests that can help you. In the CBC, you will usually find leukocytosis with neutrophilia. But be very careful with CRP. In most cases, it will be elevated, sometimes very impressive. But always keep in mind that CRP needs time to rise. So if your patient became ill suddenly, CRP may not have had the chance to reach its plateau. I've seen patients with almost normal CRP and bacterial meningitis if they came in right away on the first day of symptoms. So just be careful with that. Okay, now that you know that your patient probably has bacterial meningitis, how do you treat them? In most guidelines, the mainstay of treatment for bacterial meningitis in adults is a third generation cephalosporin like ceftriaxin. It will cover pneumococcus, meningococcus and streptococci very well. In addition to ceftriaxin, some guidelines will recommend that you add vancomycin. And the reason is that in some countries, the resistance rates of pneumococcus to ceftriaxin are already higher than 1%. So we add vancomycin as an insurance. For people over 50, for people with diabetes, for people who are immunocompromised, meaning 
people who may be infected with listeria, we will also add ampicillin or another drug that covers this pathogen because cephalosporins are ineffective against listeria monocytogenes. If you have reason to believe that the cause is pneumococcus, or if you don't know the cause right now, in addition to antibiotics, you should also add dexamethasone, a corticosteroid. Evidence shows that its anti-inflammatory effect improves survival and neurological outcome in adults. So, you will start dexamethasone at the same time as you administer antibiotics or even a little bit earlier. The duration of antimicrobial treatment also depends on the pathogen. For meningococcus, it's 7 days. For streptococcus pneumonia, it's at least 14 days if there are no complications. And for listeria, it's at least 21 days. But many times longer than that because these patients tend to be immunocompromised. But bacterial meningitis is not the only life-threatening central nervous system infection that you will encounter in practice. If you want to learn more about that, take a look at my next video. And if you want to learn how to recognize serious infections as early as possible, in the description you will find the link to my free online course that I designed for physicians who work with acutely ill patients. Thank you for watching, good luck out there and take care.